Good morning. If you're a Presbyterian and you want to be baptized, you might sit over on that side. Anybody see any drips coming down yet? Good. They're all fixed? No. We have a Presbyterian baptism here this morning. I don't think we've ever had a service where it rained in here, because I don't remember that sound on the roof. That's pretty loud, pretty loud. All right, well, uh, just most of you probably are aware that uh, we had a tragedy in the uh, Schmidt family this last week, um, Thursday, Brian Schmidt, young man, uh, son of Mel and Martha Schmidt, uh, was killed in an accident down by, by Louisville, and so we pray for them, pray and encourage you to pray for them, and uh, there, there's going to be a memorial service here at our church next Saturday at 10 o'clock, but uh, keep them in your prayers, and um, that's a tragedy that this going almost home kind of fit right in there, because Brian had his homecoming before he expected it, or anybody expected it, but so let's pray together, and we're going to get into God's Word. Father, we thank you. Thank you that you are a great and mighty and awesome God. Lord, we pray that you would have comfort, give comfort and encouragement to the grieving, Lord, for Mel and Martha and Stephen and then others in the family. We pray for them, Lord. Lift them up. Help them to have their eyes set on you. Lord, we are thankful for your mercies. They're higher than the heavens. Lord, that you love us. Help us love the things you love and hate the things you hate. And we pray for the conflict that's going on in Eastern Europe there. We pray that you would bless whatever is good and destroy whatever is evil. We pray especially for your people, the churches, ministries, seminaries, leadership of seminaries and Bible institutes that are in uh, that part of the world. Uh, we pray for them, Lord. Pray for Steve. Thank you that Mary has been able to get back to Lithuania, be with her family. We pray your blessing on them. Give them wisdom. And also, we pray for Victor and Oksana as they're close to, so close to Ukraine. And uh, their son, I think he has gone somewhere to avoid certain things. We pray for them, Lord. Keep them. Bless their family and bless their ministry. And we do thank you for everyone here. We pray for anybody that is going through hard times that you would encourage them. Thank you for our law office officers of the law, that you would strengthen them and protect them. We thank you for them, that they serve us, and we commit now our time to you as we look at your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're in James chapter 3 this morning. Um, James chapter 3, a notorious <laughs> chapter in the Bible, I guess I could use that word, famous, probably better than notorious, talking about the tongue. But uh, now, if you were born before 1990, born before 1990, not 1900, okay, there's nobody here born before. Uh, you may remember in the early 2000s, we went to war looking for Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. Remember that? They were surely hidden over there somewhere, but we never did find them. We did find Saddam Hussein in a hole in the ground. But the fact is that uh, we've all been carrying a weapon, a potential weapon of mass destruction with us all this time, even this morning. It's about two to three ounces, about four inches long, and it sits encaged behind a glistening array of biters, terrors, crushers, and grinders. Yep, we're talking about the tongue. We're talking about your tongue this morning. Are you ready? Did you wear your steel-toed shoes this morning? Because you're going to get stepped on, guaranteed. James says the tongue is set on fire by hell itself. Sort of a hellfire missile sitting there 
in your mouth. And without God's help, James is going to tell us, especially next week, there's no human means of controlling the tongue. But we're going to learn as believers in Jesus Christ, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and filled with the Holy Spirit, we're going to learn over these next two weeks to tame that tongue as believers in Christ. How often has your tongue gotten you in trouble? I'm going to say if, uh, if you breathe air here, yes, your tongue has gotten you in trouble. Man, why did I say that? If only I'd learned to keep my mouth shut. How many times have you told yourself that? We even launch personal wars with our tongues. Hey, what'd you say? Come here and say that. You better watch your mouth there, son. Our tongue needs a lot of work. We're going to talk about refraining. There's a lot of stuff you want to say, but you better be better off not saying it. Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. That's why I try to keep silent. At least you'll think I'm wise. Refraining, restraining, retraining the tongue, refraining, restraining, retraining. And we're going to have tongue trouble as long as we're in the body, as long as we're in this sinful flesh. Our tongue is driven by our sinful hearts. The reality is that most of the change, even what John read to us in Colossians 3, is one way or another connected to our tongues. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners, sinners with sinful hearts that drive sinful tongues. Your power of speech is one of the greatest gifts that God has given human beings. Think about it. We talk all the time. Life goes forward on words, tongues. We're to use our tongues for his glory and to bless other people, but instead we use them to wreak all kinds of havoc. So, now, James, as we look at James 3, James has already told us in chapter 1 that we are to be quick to hear, slow to speak. Remember that. And then he said, if you don't bridle your tongue, your religion is worthless. That's what he said, chapter 1. Now, and then he said, if your works, if your faith, we're saved by faith alone through Christ alone. We've settled on that many weeks now. But if your faith alone does not demonstrate, if your tongue doesn't demonstrate that you have faith You don't have faith, not true faith. Your speech will show your faith, maybe more than we think. And I think maybe that's why James ties this chapter 3 up to the end of chapter 2 last week. So this morning, we're going to look at the power and influence of your tongue. Next week, we're going to uh, get control over these super weapons that we carry around with us, hidden in their launching pads. So there are four gripping facts about our tongues in these first six verses. We're just going to go one verse at a time. If you're visiting with us, this is what we do. We go through the Scripture. If you don't like what we talk about, and if it's from the Scripture, don't blame me. Don't come out. Talk to God about it. He's the one that put it here. It's God's Word. The first fact that James reminds us of or tells us about is the fact of accountability, that you are going to give an account for how you use your tongue. Now, that's a scary thought. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. Jesus said in Matthew 12, he's talking to the Pharisees there, you brood of vipers, How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. And here's where Jesus and James dovetail. And I say to you that every careless word that men shall speak, they shall render account for it in the day of judgment. So our words come from our hearts. And Jesus is saying the same thing as James. 
we're accountable for what we say. We don't get away with it. You need Christ for forgiveness, for sure. Now, James says, don't, uh, how does he say that? Let not many of you become pre teachers. Teachers. So what James is saying, now teaching, of course, is words. I'm using words right now. I'm using my tongue. It's flapping. You're hearing effects of it. James says, don't, don't many of you rush into being a teacher. Teachers are going to incur stricter judgment. Where do they incur stricter judgment? Well, if they're born again, true children of God, we're going to give an account at the, great, at the uh, judgment seat of Christ. Not the great white throne judgment, but the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to give an account for what we did in our bodies. And a big part of that is what we said. James says, be aware of that. As teachers, you will incur a stricter judgment. Now, apparently in that first century, and it's, it's always been true, but it was true then and it's still true that Teachers or rabbis or leaders of the people, they tend to be honored. They tend to be esteemed, highly esteemed. And some people love that adulation. They love to be honored. And James says, you better be careful. Don't be rushing in to be a teacher looking for ego strokes. Now, James is not, I want to be sure we understand this he is not discouraging in verse one there those who are truly gifted and have a, a certain degree of maturity in them and they are called to teach he's not discouraging that but he is warning us that as we speak as teachers if we accept that position as a teacher we're going to incur a stricter judgment it says it right there we can't avoid it and the bible has a lot to say about prophets and false prophets we read recently through jeremiah and you you may remember remember jeremiah you know the babylonians are coming and false prophets arose and one of them in jeremiah 28 was hananiah and jeremiah and hananiah got together and hananiah was tickling the people's ears he was lying to the people he said within two years we're going to be free of the babylonians and jeremiah said amen may it come to pass the only fact is, is you're telling a lie, and you're going to die, Hananiah. And sure enough, within a year, Hananiah died. God does not have patience with false teachers, with people who stand in front of his people and tell lies. Jude and 2 Peter 3 talks about that. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 16, pay close attention to yourself. This is for, by the way, we have uh, teachers here. Now, we don't have women preaching to the, to the congregation, but we do have ladies' classes, and I want to tell you that we have some really wonderful female teachers here, and don't let this discourage you in any way. Everyone that I've heard about so far has been, like, spot on. You know who was this week. So we're not discouraging teaching. We have Sunday school teachers and everything, so don't worry. We're not discouraging that, but Paul does say to Timothy, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching if you're going to be a teacher. 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 5, Paul says, if anyone teaches a different doctrine and doesn't agree with sound words, he is conceited and understands nothing. He's going to give an account. I remember when I was in my first church up there in North Vernon, uh, there was a local pastor in a what we would call a ecumenical type church. And Somehow we got together uh, at our church in my office, and we were talking, and so I asked him, I said, now, I mean, do you, do you believe in hell? Because I figured he didn't. I said, do you believe in hell? He said, no. He said, well, there may be one, but nobody's going to go there. This is what the guy said. He's a pastor in a local church, and I said, well, do your people know that you don't believe in hell? He said, no, I never, I have, I've never told them that. Yeah. See, th there's a false teacher. There's a man, unless he changes, there's a man who's going to give account to God for leading God's people astray. And just, a, just a, one simple thing, there's no hell. Just like Rod Bell, love wins, no hell. 
these are false teachers, stricter judgment to stand before God's people or to podcast out or to get on YouTube or whatever and spout out all of this false teaching. We can't just pick and choose what we want to teach or what tickles people's ears. We don't play fast and loose with God's word or bend it to make it say what you want. Like some people do, they pull rabbits out of the Bible. You know, whoo, was that in there? I never saw that. Some people make a whole ministry of finding secret things in the Bible that nobody ever, nobody ever found there before. But man, people flock to them like flies after a rotting carcass. If you can get that picture in your mind. 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2, Paul told Timothy, in light of the coming judgment, preach the word, be faithful. 2 Timothy 2, 15, teachers should, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 15, should guide every teacher of God's word. Study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. So James in verse 1 here, chapter 3, he said, don't rush into that teaching position. Make sure you know what you're doing and make sure you're submitted to the word of God. Apollos is a great model of a, I don't know if he was a young man at that point, but Apollos, you know, in, in Acts, uh, I think it was 18, at the end there, he was, something was missing in his teaching. There was an element missing. And so uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila pulled him aside and they showed him the way more accurately. And Apollos is an, a great example of a submissive, teacher and he went on and became a great preacher over there in Corinth I think he was in Ephesus and then he went over to Corinth but it's beautiful he received it and he didn't react to it so uh, that not many of you become teachers my prayer every week is Lord help me I want to be faithful to the scripture we're not going to be preach cotton candy sermons ear tickling sermons Slingshot sermons, stretching that text to make it say what you want to say. And topical sermons are okay if they're accurate, but it's too easy to, for a preacher to get off on his own little hobby horse there. All right, accountability. Now, you say, well, you're talking to preachers and teachers. No, we're talking to you. Point number two. The fact is your tongue is a leading indicator of your spiritual maturity, look what James says, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says or trip in what he says, he is a perfect man or a mature man, able to bridle the whole body as well. So here James lumps all of us together. We all stumble in our word. How many? All of us. We all all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all mess up with our words, with our tongues. In many ways, he says. And preachers are no exception. You know, I, I've been preaching since 1978, and that's 44 years, and that's a ton of sermons, and that's a whole bunch of words. And, uh, you know, preachers are going to have to give an account. I'm going to have to give an account. But we all stumble. You stumble in what you say. It's not perfection that God is calling for with our tongues it's direction someone said so this applies to all of us one of the easiest ways to trip up in your spiritual life is with your tongue we all stumble in many ways Thomas Manton the Puritan wrote quote most of a man's sins are in his tongue end quote We bring habits of speech with us right out of the old life. And we even pick them up as believers. When you hang around people who are constantly griping or cussing or telling people off and so on, grumbling, watch out. You'll pick that up. No one makes you cuss, but bad company corrupts good morals, the Bible says. So as long as we're in this body, we're going to trip up in what we say, and we're going to need forgiveness. And there's growth. There's growth in the use of our tongue. We'll be talking more about that probably next week. But God is all about changing progressive sanctification. That includes our tongue. We ought to be learning to put off these old habits that we just heard about in Colossians 3 and put on 
those new ways of speaking, learning more and more how to control that slippery muscle between your teeth. And James says if you're succeeding in controlling your tongue, you'll be succeeding in bridling your whole body, your whole body. Isn't that what he said? If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. If your talk is loose, your walk will be loose, says James. So, this week, keep alert to your tongue. Keep alert to what you say. Is what you are saying glorifying God? Is what you are saying building others up. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, only such a word as is good for edification. How many times we blow it there, right? But that's what God calls us to. Somebody said, James talks about a perfect man, somebody said, that man is nowhere to be found. <laughs> Someone who has completely controlled his tongue. So, let me give you something to do there with that. Use the fruit of the Spirit to evaluate your words. Are my words loving? Not always. Are my words joyful? Not always. Or are they complaining? Are my words peaceful? Or are they irritable? Expressing irritation. Are my words patient, kind, good, faith-building, gentle, self-controlled? As your tongue is spirit-controlled, the rest of your body, James says, comes under that control. So if you can control what you say, you're doing quite well. Third gripping truth about your tongue, this little sliver of flesh, disproportionate influence. Your tongue is the most influential member of your body. Now we'll look at verses 3 through 5. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder, comparatively, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires that ship to go. So also the tongue is a small part of the body. And yet it boasts great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. There's three small things here. A bit, a rudder, and a fire. A match. They are all little in size, but huge in influence. A horse is a powerful animal. I love to see horses running. and Man, powerful, beautiful creatures of God, right? How are you going to control that horse? Remember Alexander the Great, he had Bucephalus, and he's a wild horse. He learned to control him by keeping him from seeing his own shadow. That's what was spooking him all the time. James says these bits will control a horse. We went horseback riding in Texas many years ago. And it was a lot of fun. So we were walking. I don't know what you call a horse. It's just, it's not a canter. It's less than a canter, but anyway. So there we were in a row, and we're following the trail. We're going down the trail. It's kind of out in a wilderness kind of an area there. And uh, we were all in a row, and all of a sudden, three or four or more big black turkey vulture type birds went out, went from the bushes over there, and it just spooked those horses, and we all went flying down the trail. <laughs> One of our, we had a lady, a girl with us, and she was in front of me, bopping. <laughs> I mean, how are we going to get these horses under control? Yeah. Try to pull back on that bridle or the uh, harness. It's got the bit on it. 
bring that thing back under control. That's our tongue. Bring it under control. Huge ships. We've all read of shipwrecks. When the wind blows and blows the ship onto the rocks. A lot of stories about shipwrecks like that. But James says, a very small rudder can make that ship go the way the pilot wants it to go. It may take pressure to keep it on track. James says the tongue is like these small and yet so influential things in your life. And so influential in your life, excuse me. That little sliver of two or three ounces can do amazing things. You can shape words with it. Every little baby learns to shape words with her tongue. And if you're going to learn Spanish, you're going to have to learn Roberto. Roll those R's. Roberto. You know, can you do that? Make that tongue do what you want it to do. But it can wreak havoc. I love Psalm 73, 9. I don't love it. I mean, it's a descriptive. He sa it says, they set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. What a picture. Their tongue struts through the earth. We hear this from politicians. Their tongue struts. We hear this on the mainstream news. Their tongue struts. Every night they're strutting and we're all there. Well, I'm not. Are you listening to them? <laughs> they're lies. Strutting, but strutting. Just think of that. Just picture that. Tongues of this world just strutting through the earth. It can wreak havoc, that tongue. In verse 5, James remind us, well, for us we could say only you can prevent forest fires. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. How great a forest can be set on fire by the little spark. It's amazing. Uh, once again, many years ago, when you get old, you're always talking about many years ago. <laughs> this was back in the 70s. But I was working construction, and what mainly I did was we set up, uh, set up doors, and uh, I sprayed them with stain, and then I took rags and I wiped them off because we were doing a lot of them at one time, so it's not like brushing this. We were just, and one night, I threw these stain rags into a sort of a corner there up against the wall. The next morning, when I got back to that place of work, about 6 o'clock, man, it smells like something's burning. All I can tell you right now is God was good because those stained rags, what do you call that? Spontaneously combusted, literally, and started burning. And the, this is an old building, and the studs that were exposed were blackened up to a certain extent. And that whole building really should have gone down in flames. There was a business on the other end of the building. And I just, thank you, Lord. I had no idea that oily stain rags, you put them together, and I did it as an experiment. And sure enough, it, you put them together, and they will spontaneously ignite. They create heat. And that little creating of heat could burn down who knows what. Here James says, a little fire, maybe one match, can set a whole country on fire and bring huge destruction. Now, the tongue is a fire, it's a flamethrower, leaving scorched earth all around. Just a few words fired from this flamethrower can destroy relationships. Maybe you've been singed by some of that fire. 
can burn the hearts of children, can rip to shred marriages, blast families, destroy churches and friendships. A little thing, but great influence. Unrestrained can leave a war zone in its path. And then James says in verse 6, overwhelming destruction. We've already talked about it like that, but he says, your tongue can bring horrible destructive power, James 3, 6. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body <clears throat> and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. There's a Lutheran commentator. His last name is Lenski. Some of you may have read some of his commentaries. Very good. Here's what he said about that verse right there. Quote, nothing stronger was ever said about the tongue, end quote. Verse 6. Edmund Hebert, a commentator I use as I prepare for James, he devoted four and a half pages to this verse alone. Here James bores in. The tongue is like a flamethrower. It destroys other humans. It spouts all kinds of iniquity, the very world of iniquity. It has the power to defile, to corrupt, to inject spiritual poison and destroy an entire culture. As you think about the tongues strutting through the earth, driven by hearts that are at enmity with God. Go into a university classroom and listen to the poison being injected into the young minds. How much worse, like the example I gave you earlier, where a pastor is defiling and poisoning his congregation with lies. Christianity and liberalism. You're all good people. Just try a little harder. We'll all be there together. You better insist on hearing truth from your pastor. Tongues are busy injecting false notions into our children. In classrooms, teachers speak and direct the thoughts of students. You know it. The power of the tongue of that individual teaching a classroom of people, any age, that's a powerful thing. Education. When America was founded, the schools, Harvard, were founded to prepare young people, young men especially, to preach the word. It was the whole purpose of the educational system back then. Now what's being injected into these young minds and children? Telling elementary school children they have the right to change their gender if they want without the parents knowing about it. This is using the tongue out of hell. You can use your flame-throwing tongue to burn down a church, a business, a family, an organization. James says the tongue is set on fire by hell. What does he mean by that? That's Gehenna, hell, Gehenna. That Jesus used it as a picture. It's that place outside of Jerusalem where they took all the junk and burned it, and it was always burning apparently and smoke rising up, and it was a great picture of eternal hell. But what does James mean when he says the tongue is set on fire by hell? Certainly he means that Satan has no more effective weapon in his arsenal than the human tongue. Think of gossip and slander and how much of that goes on. John MacArthur quotes a sports writer for the Atlanta Journal. I think this is in his commentary on James, but listen to this. Quote, 
I am more deadly than the screaming shell from the howitzer. I win without killing. I tear down homes, break hearts, and wreck lives. I travel on the wings of the wind. No innocence is strong enough to intimidate me. No purity pure enough to daunt me. I have no regard for truth, no respect for justice, no mercy for the defenseless. My victims are as numerous as the sands of the sea and often as innocent. I never forget and seldom forgive. My name is Gossip. Wow. So James says the tongue is set on fire. The tongue sets on fire the course of our lives, which has the idea of a wheel, like your whole life from womb to tomb is like you're rolling through life, and the tongue affects all of it. How often have you said something, like I said at the beginning, you wish a string was attached to that word. Oh, man, why did I say that? Let me bring that back real quick. Yeah. You probably all heard the story about the local gossip, the village gossip, who was gossiping about a local merchant, hurt the merchant, his reputation, hurt his business, and the gossip got concerned about the evil that he'd done, so he went to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, I've caused all this trouble. What do I do? The rabbi said, thought, and he said, go get a feather pillow and bring it to me. So the man went and got that feather pillow and brought it to him. And the rabbi said, now go up, go upstairs, open a window, take the feather pillow, tear it apart, and let the wind carry those feathers wherever they will. And then go pick up the feathers. Impossible, said the gossip. Exactly that's what happens when you gossip or tell a story about someone else. Our mouth speaks from our hearts. Our heart wags our tongues. If we know Christ, we have a new heart. We have the Spirit of God within us. We can gain power over our tongue. We're going to talk about taming beasts next week. We have a redeemed mouth, a spirit-controlled tongue. Excuse me, tongue. It's a powerful weapon, that tongue of yours. How are you using it? Proverbs 18, 21, beautiful statement. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. How are you using your tongue? I think we're all going to have to pray about this one. <laughs> using it for life or for death? As a fountain of life, blessing the people in your life? Or a flamethrower destroying people who get in your way. Just monitor your words this week. See if your words are glorifying God, ministering to other people, or are they self promoting, boastful, you know, making sure everybody knows how important you are, how great you are, all that you've done. May God help us to speak with redeeming grace since Christ died on that cross to redeem our tongues. May God help us to speak with redeeming grace and kindness to others this week. And here I have a verse for you to memorize. Those newcomers, they have to memorize, don't they? We want to make sure they all do it. I think we'll have an accountability time here on Sunday morning in the worship. You won't have anybody in your class next week. Colossians 4, 6. Look at this. This is simple, but how good. Let your speech always be with grace, encouraging. As though seasoned with salt, truthful, so that you will know how you ought to respond to each person. Wisdom, knowing how to respond. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for James. Lord, he just... Steps right all, all over us here with our tongues. Forgive us for how we just speak without control, without controlling those tongues, Lord. Help us this week to glorify you, to honor you, 
to be a blessing to others, to encourage others with our tongues. Forgive us for how often we have messed up, we have stumbled, and we all stumble. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we finished.